One of the things I wanted to talk about today is I just launched the second edition of my very first book. So 14 or 12 years ago, I wrote my very first book. Oh, and... wait, sorry. Let's actually go introduce you. So I'm Alexis. Welcome back to the podcast. This is Cynthia. Can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, and first of all, before I introduce myself, I just want to say thank you because I know it takes courage to have your own podcast and really put yourself out there. So on behalf of a woman to woman, thank you for doing that. Thank you. So my name is Cynthia Ruiz and I am an author, executive coach, professor, leader. I come from dual backgrounds, so I am Latina on my dad's side. My grandparents came from Mexico to Los Angeles a hundred years ago. And on my mom's side, I'm Native American Cherokee. So I come from blended cultures and I am just passionate about helping people. Yay. <laughs> so let's go into your book that you were mentioning. So I am very fortunate because I have written a total of five different books. And so what I did with my latest book, it's the second edition of my very first book. So 12 years ago, I wrote my very first book. It's called Finding Sane Relationships in a Crazy World. Why did you write the book the first time? So the truth of the matter is I was having a conversation with one of my male friends and he said, you know what? You really have a unique perspective. I think you should write a book. And I don't even consider myself a good writer, but I said, okay, let me think about that. So I actually meditated and went to sleep, woke up the next morning and I had the title and the outline of the book. And I said, okay, I guess I'm supposed to write this book. And when people hear the title, Finding Sane Relationships in a Crazy World, people are like, oh, this is going to help me get a man. Oh, this is going to help me find a <laughs> wife. But it really, it deals with all relationships in our life. And the premise of the book is you are the foundation for all relationships in your life. Mm -hmm. So if you take the time to work on yourself, you will have better relationships I guarantee it. And I'm not just talking about romantic relationships. I mean, let's face it, we're uh, by human nature, we're social creatures. And so we thrive off of people. And so we have relationships with family, with our partners, with our children, with our friends, with our neighbors, with our coworkers, and it goes on and on and on. So for me, what I did with the second book is I now have added 21 different exercises. So it's almost like a workbook. Okay. I want to help people do the work to make their lives better. So their relationships could be better. Yeah. So the, so how do, so the, I know you kind of mentioned that the next book has more exercises, but how does the first one and the second one also differ in other ways? Well, to be honest, it differs because I'm not the same person I was 12 years ago. And I've you know, gained so much more wisdom. And because the, with the first book, I did a lot of promotion and I got hired to go to Texas and all over to do workshops around the book. So through the process of sharing this information and doing workshops with people, and now I do the workshops virtually, I got feedback and I was able to determine what areas people wanted more and basically they did they told me yeah, this is great information but how do i incorporate this information into my life yes and so that's why i started adding all these different exercises yeah um what inspired you to write about this well to be honest i my entire life has been around helping people so I have a master's degree in counseling. And so I have always been a fan of self-help and personal development. That's my genre. And I have a lot of people that I look up to like Jack Canfield, who wrote, uh, he wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul. He wrote oh, Chicken Soup for Every Soul. I miss those books. Yeah, right. And so fast forward, 
uh, during the pandemic, and we can talk about the pandemic, yeah. I actually got the opportunity. He invited me to his home and interviewed me for his show talking about success. So I said, you know, my life has come full circle. All this additional knowledge that I've acquired over the past 12 years, how can I share it and help people's lives? So self-help has always been my passion. Like I said, I then started a PhD program in psychology. And unfortunately, because of life, I had to drop out. At the time I was married, I had a young son and I just started a business and was working seven days a week. So I, this is before, this is way back in the day. So before you can take classes online. So I started saying, okay, what can I do? So I had to drop out of the PhD program. But life comes full circle. And earlier this year, I actually got an honorary doctorate degree Yay. from a one of the, the young woman that I used to mentor. So this field of self-help and personal development has always, always been a passion of mine my entire life. So that's really the lane that I operate in and I feel comfortable. And I, I just want to help people have, you know, live their lives to the fullest. Yeah. So let's go into the pandemic because we were having a conversation before we started recording and we were talking about how the pandemic, I was telling you how like I, I had something going on and the pandemic also added to like this trauma or like this experience of being overwhelmed. So in, in between all that, I felt like um, I kind of started to become more depressed <laughs> And I started to maybe even lose some sight of like my femininity because um, I felt like I was in like survival mode of having to figure everything out on my own. Um, so how do you think um, or what's your take on the pandemic and affecting other people's like mental well-being? Well, first of all, let me say I'm spiritual, not religious. So I use the term creator, God, universal consciousness all interchangeably. So my overall take on the pandemic, it was creator's way of giving everybody a timeout because I don't care how old you were. I don't care how much money you had. I don't care your gender, your race. Everybody was impacted by the pandemic and we didn't see it coming. Now, I know you said that you had to do everything on your own, but I truly had to do everything on my own because I live alone. So for the year of 2020, 90% of the time I was by myself and guess what I was happy because I like okay I have the freedom to do whatever I want when I want I mean of course alone so I like took online makeup classes and I did all kinds of stuff I walked every day I danced I'm like you know what I'm gonna use this as an opportunity but the reality is because we didn't see it coming most people did not you know, some people haven't even recovered from the pandemic because it changed everything. Everything that we knew was our normal going into it. Everything from our personal relationships to our work. I mean, prior to the pandemic, I didn't hear people remotely working. I mean, that was few and far between. But now, you know, people demand they want to work remotely. So it shifted everything. And it cre also created a lot of fear and uncertainty because of a lot of people were drinking during that because they didn't know how to cope. Right. And, and we were at the same time dealing with loss. A lot of people died. A lot of people lost their jobs. So it was a big shakeup that we're slowly coming out of, even though we may not hear the word COVID very often, but we still, as our individual selves, have not fully you know, healed because we didn't know how to. So everybody's been impacted in different ways. And as we came out of it or coming out of it, some people have fared better than others. Right, I agree. How do you think uh, you implemented the experience of the pandemic into your book? So it, because it's something that everybody felt, um, I think that that was even more reason for me to um, show people that there's exercises you could do. So what I like to tell people is everybody has emotional baggage and the pandemic created emotional baggage. 
Now, the way I define emotional baggage is I believe when we're first born, we're a baby and we're happy and healthy. When you want food or you, you know need your diaper change, you cry. Otherwise, you're pretty happy. But in life, we have experiences. The good experiences create memories, but the bad experiences create emotional baggage. Everybody's emotional baggage is different. It can show up in your life as anger, resentment, fear, insecurities, shame, guilt, all this stuff that we carry around and most people don't know what to do with it. Some people go to therapy, which if you go to therapy, I commend you. Um, I have a brother that works a 12-step program. He is an AA and has been sober for 12 years. So there are different ways to handle it, but the average person doesn't know what to do with it. So to me, with the exercises, whether it be, you know, taking an inventory of people in your life or looking in the mirror and, you know, identifying who you are, all these things I think are tools that someone can use in their life to release their emotional baggage, let that go and be happy and healthy. And once you do that, all of your relationships will get better because you heal. Right. I agree. Uh, what, um, what, what did you call them? Exercises. Sorry. What exercises did you input into the book that you think would help people? Well, I think one of the exercises, and, it, and it's, I've used this for a long time, is I call it uh, the she test. And this is not a gender-based test. It's a self-happiness evaluation. Mm -hmm. And so I ask people to really be honest with themselves and ask themselves what percentage of the time are they happy and what percentage of the time are you not and most people don't even think about it. they just go through life but once you you know pose that question to people i had this one woman who was a high-powered attorney and on the outside everybody thought oh you know she's so successful and i asked her that question and she said 60 percent and i go okay 60 percent of the time happy that's not bad she goes no, 60% of the time I'm unhappy. I'm like, ooh, okay. And because you never know what people are going through. Right. Because so much is in their mind, right? Yeah. And, we're, and we're not mind readers. At least I'm not a mind reader. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so you don't know what somebody's going through. And so, you know, when you're being honest and asking yourself those questions, then the follow-up question is, okay, if you're unhappy 60% of the time, what is getting in the way of your happiness? What is blocking you from your happiness? And that, and I, I, my answer is it's your emotional baggage. So once you identify your emotional baggage and work through it and release it, then you can work towards happiness. So, you know, it's interesting because there was a study by Harvard University and they did this, the longest study of happiness ever over a 75 year period. And their conclusion was the key to happiness in life is not money. It's not your job title. It's the quality of your relationships. We all need people to be happy. So it's how you show up in these relationships. And if you're happy and healthy and you show up, then, you know, and it's not about trying to control the other person. You only have control of your side of the street. So you know, work on yourself and be happy and you're going to have better relationships and a better life. Do you have any experiences or other people's experiences like off the top of your head of like what a toxic relationship looks like? And that could be like romantic or friendships or, you know, whichever type of relationship. Girl, I have a lot of personal experience <laughs> with toxic, really, toxic relationships. I mean, I was married for 13 years and I was a, in a physically abusive relationship. It wasn't only physically abusive. That's just one part of it. It, it was a psychologically abusive relationship because it was a relationship with a um, macho male that had certain beliefs about women and when I started to thrive and shine, it made him feel insecure. I was thought I was very supportive. I, I tried to be a good wife, a good mom. I'm certainly not saying I'm perfect because I wasn't perfect, but you know, it, it really, his insecurities came out. So his 
you know, response was trying to control me. And the more he tried to control me, the more I wanted to rebel. And then that's then it turned physical. So there's been that experience. And it took me a long time to make a decision to get out of that relationship because I know it's not easy to, to leave. But the final straw for me is when he was physically abusive to me in front of my seven-year-old son. And I realized, okay, if I stay in this relationship, my son's going to think this is normal. Yeah. Because he did a good I, good job of hiding it. I hid it. I didn't, I have three brothers. If I would have told my brothers, they, they would have went in and who do, did who know what to, knows what to him. So I, ha, I just kept it. And so I was carrying around the shame and guilt of being in this relationship. And then fast forward, you know, friendships. Sometimes there's friendships that are filled with drama and negativity. And so I've had to make difficult decisions and let some people go. And a lot of people say, well, I can't let that friendship go. And I had one ch friendship because it, we had been friends a long time and mm -hmm. it just got so draining. It was so negative and she was so, so much drama. Everything was drama. And I said, you know what? I don't need this toxicity in my life. So I made a conscious decision to remove myself from that relationship but a lot of people think they don't have a choice i know I, and i remember that from uh, the book that you had the exercise was to list the people in your life and the first word that comes to mind is how you kind of determine if you really should have them in your life or if they're toxic in your life like depending on like those words that you think off the top of your head um, did you happen to do that exercise? Is that? Yeah. So every exercise in the book is, <laughs> is things that I've developed on my own that I've done myself. And so thank you for bringing it up because the first exercise is really taking an inventory of people in your life. We just go through life and don't really think about it. But I like to be strategic in life and really kind of, you know, I, I'm very data driven so it's like okay where's the data Who, who's in my life let, let's, <laughs> let's look around and then it's like how i not only are, how do i feel about them and i take responsibility how am i showing up because if there's True. somebody that's negative all the time then i kind of have like a bad reaction to all that negativity and so do i show up as the best friend probably not so it's taking an inventory and not only looking at how the other person you know, makes us feel, but how we participate in that relationship. I agree. I I also can relate to having a, a long-term friend for so long since I was like a child. And I had held off on discon like just, I held, I knew in my head, I was like, I don't think we're friends anymore. Like I grew apart from this person, but because of the, the childhood term that people say oh this is my oldest friend or like I've known them since I was a kid people feel more obligated to stay in that friendship mm -hmm. and it doesn't even have to have any like depth in it it just it's just that's the title of it is that that's my oldest friend I have to stay friends with them um and that's how I felt for so many years and it wasn't until recently I think uh, I decided to just like walk away from this friendship um probably about like three or four years ago and I decided like I I don't think this friendship is it, it felt very one-sided it felt mm. like this person would seek for my advice on things or just like for me to be there for them and they always felt that I was always there for them um but like when it came to me needing somebody and like I mentioned like I don't usually ask people for help anyway and I think I I felt insecure and I felt like I couldn't trust that person to to hold my most you know personal experiences I felt like there was a lot of competition in between that friendship and I think that that kind of ruined our friendship and that's for both ends because I I felt competitive and she was competitive and it was just like toxic well, um, thank you for bringing that point up <laughs> because that takes me into the next point. Yeah. Is one of the exercises is defining your relationship values. What's in, what are your values in a relationship? Trust, reciprocity, right. making sure it's back and forth, um, honesty. I mean, 
each of us get to decide what's important and what our relationship values are. And then once we identify what our relationship values are, then we can take a look at our different relationships and see if those values are being honored. Right. I agree. And I feel like that friendship took me, I, I read about this. I think, I think it's from like, I don't know it might have been like not a writer or something they were saying how really uh, friendships are relationships and when you come out of uh, you know that friendship you also need to mourn it mm -hmm. and it's weird because like I didn't see it that way and it took me a while like sometimes I would be like you know obviously it's like it makes sense to me now like obviously yeah I'm gonna think back on memories and good times and so that just like the morning process of it and I just didn't see it that way because it wasn't like a romantic relationship or anything you probably felt guilty didn't you I did <laughs> sometimes I still do I'm not gonna lie sometimes I feel guilty but I think overall it was the it was a good decision on my end for me to do that and for me to do that for her too right. so that way we weren't just in this relationship that was like not even like we grew apart yeah. And that was the reality of it. Well, one thing I like to tell people is, first of all, everything runs in cycles. Life runs in cycles. There's a beginning and an end. And everything's temporary. Life is temporary. So when you understand that, when a relationship, a friendship comes to the end of its cycle, yeah, you can end it, but exactly. You have to mourn it, grieve it. What I like to do is you know, bless it. Say, okay, thank you for that 10 years that I had with you. Uh, you were in my life for me to learn lessons, but I've learned the lessons and it's time for um, me to move on. So I show you gratitude. Now, I don't have to tell that person that. I may be saying this to myself, but it's like, okay, now it's time to move on. Just like, you know, nature runs in cycles. There's seasons, you know, we know that the sun's going to come up every day. The moon's going to come up every night. And so everything runs in cycles. And once you understand that, then you don't try to hang on past its time. Right. Have you ever hung on to, well, your marriage also. I was going to say, have you ever hung on to like a relationship? Oh, girl. You didn't need to. <laughs> Let me tell you. So after my relationship, my marriage ended, I ended it. I came out with zero self-esteem. Zero self-esteem. So what did I do? I jumped into the first relationship that came along and stayed way too long because it was an unhealthy relationship. But because my ex-husband had planned it in my mind that, oh, you're not this, you're not good enough, you're blah, blah, you'll never find anybody, blah, blah, blah. So I, I hung on to the first thing that came along and I'm like, oh my God, it was not a healthy relationship. So the final straw was, he, he says, Either you marry me or I'll never talk to you again. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I got to go. <laughs> I mean, do, do you think that was a marriage proposal somewhere in there? Because <laughs> I didn't hear anything like that and I, and I got to go. <laughs> so, yes, of course, we've all been in, you know, situations and I'm no different. I'm human. I, I have, you know, I like to say we're spiritual beings having a human experience. I've had a lot of human experience. <laughs> but what I'd like to say is I think uh, hopefully I've learned from those experiences and worked on myself and become a, a better person. Are you constantly working on yourself? Working on yourself is an ongoing process until the day you die. I mean, because if you stop, then you stop living. Because again, living is evolving and and to me that and that's where you started earlier about asking what's different in the book, you know, over twelve years. I'm different. Yeah. I, I and so I hope that's reflected in the book that, you know, I've updated it to include thing uh, me who I am today. And of course of course I'm not the perfect person. I I compete with nobody except for myself. I wake up and say I want to be a better person than I was yesterday. I'm not competing with people you see on TV or anybody else, because excuse my language, I don't give a shit, but uh, I want to be the best version of me. So one of the books that impacted my life was a book um, called The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. He's same last name, but no relation. Uh, and it's like simple Toltec wisdom, you know, be 
impeccable with your word. Words are powerful. You know, be careful with what you say, especially the self-talk that yes. we give ourselves. You know, don't assume anything. Don't take things personal and always do your best. So I always try to show up and be the best version of me each and every day. And again, sometimes I get it right and sometimes I don't. But you know what? I keep going. Have you ever... I can sense that you're, you don't compete with people, but I am curious, have you ever felt that people are competing with you? Oh, absolutely. And, and the sad thing about it, it is been the women have been yes, the worst. Yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and, but you know, it's, it's men have helped me along my career, but the, the women have been competitive, but I think it's not their fault because I think that's what society does to us. It pits us against each other. But I get so many compliments today because what they tell me is that you're one of the few women that help other women. So I help other women not to get anything back just because I know how difficult it has been for me in my life as a trailblazer. So if I could turn around and lift somebody up because I believe when we help each other, we all rise. And so, yeah, it's, it's it, you know, there's been competition, but I don't compete back. So what are they going to do? <laughs> yeah, no, I've, I've definitely felt that a lot of my, I guess, work life. It's always felt like that and mm -hmm. I, I sense it. I don't let it phase me because I'm not competing with anybody mm -hmm. either. Like I really just want to like do my own thing and be a better version of myself. And I, well, my problem is that I'm always trying to prove to myself that I can do things. Like I was mentioning to you earlier, like I had a, like low self-esteem for a long time and I probably still do. Um, but I'm always trying to prove to myself that I'm not dumb and that I'm smart and that I can do things. So because of that mindset, I don't care about anybody else. So that's like the positive part of that is that I, I'm very like, what, what do they say when you have like those, like those blinders? blinders. Yeah. It's like tunnel vision. I, I'm not looking at anyone else's life in that way. And I'm not trying to be anybody else. I just want to be a better version of myself. Um, and, and let's say so who what is who defines what smart and intelligent is because you take an IQ test or because you have a college degree now I'm blessed because I do have a college degree but I have seen some people with some with a PhDs and college degrees and they have no common sense so it's <laughs> so, so the in the label of smart or intelligence is not linear it's not one thing there's many forms of intelligence so Girl, you're one of the smartest women I've met. So I think you just need to own that and not, you know, compare. And, and so, and that goes back to what I was talking about, emotional baggage. Somebody told us that we weren't smart. Somebody told us we weren't good enough. You know, all, I have so many stories where people told me this, that, and the other. And guess what? I'm like, I don't believe them because I said, I am going to do this. For me, education was important because it was my way out. I grew up in an environment of negativity and gangs and my older brother was in drugs and went in and out in jail and I'm like, okay, I want to be the best version of me and I chose my education and I have no regrets because it's helped me accomplish all the things that I've accomplished and get to where I am. Was it easy? No, but I also believe that by me taking that difficult path it's now, you know, changed generations. So my son got a college degree. Uh, I'm happy that I'm going to be a grandma this year. Yay. And I'm hoping that the, we call him baby chocolate or him. Or, well, I don't know if it's him or her. Ooh. 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 <laughs> that was a sort of Freudian slip. Um, the <laughs> baby Chavez uh, gets a college degree. So it's about not just doing things for individual, because if you're Latino, if you're native, we have generational trauma. Yeah. That, you know, like people are feeling anxiety and they're like, why am I feeling anxiety? It's not even yours. It's stuff that's been with the Native Americans in this country. We've gone through genocide. So, you know, it's healing on all different levels because that generational trauma is really on cellular levels. So it, it's a lot to unpack. But, you know, today I'm happy, whole and complete. And grateful and blessed. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely.
why do you think some people obviously this is a open-ended question why do you think some people decide to just stay in these toxic relationships because it's hard work to get out i mean when sometimes people are comfortable sitting in their own shit sorry <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that but you know it's because you, that's what you know yes so what they in my opinion you stay there because you're afraid of the unknown okay if i get out of this then what what maybe i won't find somebody maybe it'll be worse and so you're playing out all these scenarios but Sometimes you just got to believe in yourself, be courageous and take the first step and know that everything is going to work out exactly the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. Do you, I mean, I could speak for this on my own. Like I normalized chaos as a child and therefore as I became an adult, a young adult, I didn't realize what anxiety was and I almost like decided to just I mean, I did, I, and this for a lot of decisions too, is just like self-sabotaging. And I think that's, uh, that's a thing. And when people are in toxic relationships, they almost feel like that's normal. Right. Especially many of the people I know, you know, we talk about dysfunctional families. I don't know anybody that had a functional family. <laughs> I mean, even people with lots of money, um, they feel like their parents were never there because they were always working and everybody right. has their their stuff and so you know what what you your environment that you grow up in is what you consider normal. normal and so as an adult you have to ask yourself the question is that who I want to be today and I believe that you know dysfunctional situations create that emotional baggage and so once you release all that and realize you have the power we live in a world of free will meaning that you can have whatever life you want based on the choices you make. So if you're unhappy with any part of your life, make different choices. But a lot of people stay where they're at because they're afraid. And a lot of this stuff takes work and it's hard work. To, yeah. I mean, because when you're changing that paradigm and letting go of those emotions, you know, a lot of stuff comes up and it's hard and you cry and whatever. And so some people, when those emotions come up, they just bury them. I, I don't want to deal with that. But it's really, I know it's hard, but once you get to the other side, it's so much better. Yeah, I agree. Um, like I told you, I, I started therapy yesterday and I was... Well, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was, I was anxious to start therapy because of that reason of having to fill them in about things that create like triggers or just like things that make me more anxious. And it, I was anxious before I even told my therapist anything because I didn't want to relive anything and I didn't want to just like unravel all that baggage and just like, kind of like leave it up there in the air. I wanted to just like not say anything, but the other part of my brain is like, no, I need to. Then it's kind of pointless if you don't say anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so the other part of my brain is like fighting with another part of my brain that's like, no, you need to go to therapy like now. Right. And the other one is like, no, you, could, you should just like ignore everything and leave it. <laughs> well, and let me tell you from my personal experience, and we've talked about this before, because I experienced a lot of sexual trauma when I was young. So I didn't have the coping skills to deal with it. So I buried it and it came out in a different way. I became an overachiever. It's like, I buried it. I don't want to deal with those feelings. I don't want to deal with those emotions. So let me just put all my energy into getting my college education. And so by the time I was 23, I had a master's degree because I went the opposite. And, and when you start dealing with those feelings, it, it's not fun, but again, once transitions are never easy but once you get to the other side um, you know you ask them what took me so long <laughs> what was i waiting for because a lot of it um the anxiety and those emotions only exist in your head yes. they don't exist outside your head we're our worst own enemies many times yes i agree you know as you're saying that that reminded me of oprah because oprah was also an overachiever 
um, and she was... What girl? Are you comparing me to Oprah? Yeah. No, but because, okay, so let me just tell you a really quick story. So one time I used to say, I want to be the Latina Oprah, <laughs> right? And then some guy, so I went to this seminar with Deepak Chopra, yeah. blah, 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 blah. And, and one of the guys, I said, don't say that. Don't ever compare yourself to her. And I think, I don't know if he thought I wanted her money. It wasn't about the money. It's that she used her platform for good. Yeah. So guess what? I stopped saying that. And I don't even, you know, so until you brought that up right now, it kind of triggered them. I'm like, oh, yeah, I used to say I wanted to be the Latina Oprah because I didn't think we had one. And again, that's, that's, true. that's not me thinking I'm better than anybody else. It's just that I've done a lot of work and, and helped a lot of people and I want to help even more. Yeah. But it, but it outside influence stop me from declaring that that's interesting so i'm going to declare it. i want to be the latina oprah yeah <laughs> i mean you you definitely i don't i don't like to say overachiever because it sounds like a negative word but right. right um but you definitely have accomplished like a lot of things and you're amazing and Thank you. I, I don't know how you've managed to complete all these things because there's just you've done so much and you you're always like so giving too and um I think that was your I mean that's your purpose right is just to give and help people and obviously to receive like we were mentioning like there's a balance in that can you explain what that is right so in my opinion there are a lot of universal laws that have been around since the beginning and they're not attached to any religion they're spiritual universal laws and one of them is the law of reciprocity what that means is that we are all energy and so when you give you have to be able to receive to have that full circle and when we give and we shut the door to receiving then it's lopsided and so I think you know most of women that I know are giver, 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 but they don't learn how to receive because then all of a sudden they feel it's selfish. And um, I've come to a point in my life, I'm real good with self-care. You know, I get my massage once a month. My masseuse comes to my house. Like I do things for me. I make sure I walk every day. I eat healthy because it's good for me. And so uh, the law of reciprocity is have, you have to have the energy flowing both ways. A few years ago, they were talking about these universal laws and they were talking about the law of attraction. You know, law of attraction, just sit there and you can think of anything and the you know, Rolls Royce shows up in your driveway. <laughs> well, it doesn't work like that. What they didn't tell you, the law of attraction, attracting things in your life is real, but there's also a, a law of inspired action. I Meaning you have to do the work. <laughs> you can't just sit there and think it and it's gonna happen. You have to do the work. and. And, you know, when you're passionate about something, you tend to, you know, do the work and be happy about it. And that creates a different vibrational level. What are some exercises that you can give? And this is because I need this for myself, uh, is to create better self-talk. So I am a big believer in positive affirmations. Now, what positive affirmations are, are talking to yourself in a positive way. And I believe that it's a way to reprogram our mind because our thoughts and beliefs are created by society, our family, the educational system, all of this creates our belief system. And so a lot of that could be negative. So we have to take control of our own belief system and use positive affirmations to reprogram your brain. So uh, for example, one of the things I use a lot, and I have an executive coaching business, I use a lot with women in particular, women don't feel worthy. Uh, uh, we just society, we feel like second class citizens and that men are more important. And that could be a cultural thing, that could be a society thing. So we really, I tell women, write down every day for 30 days, I am worthy, I am worthy. And, and if they, they could add whatever they want. I am worthy of love, I am worthy of success. I am worthy of happiness and repeat that every day for 30 days because they say it takes 30 days to develop a habit. And so I want your habit to be self-talk in a positive way. And I, you know, to me, positive affirmations are such a powerful thing. And when I do in-person workshops, I have everybody standing up doing positive affirmations and it feels good. And everybody's like, yeah. 
So yeah, that for me, positive affirmations are a way to reprogram your brain. What's another way that you try to reprogram your brain? And uh, I also wanted to ask, like, do you still, I, this might be silly, but I feel like you're so like grounded. Do you still experience like anxiety and stuff? So I think every person on earth experiences <laughs> anxiety, but it, it's interesting because my son at one point told me, do you worry about anything? <laughs> because I, what I try to do is have perspective. It's like, okay, this situation came up. Do I have control over it? And then I say the serenity prayer and basically identify what I have control over and what I don't. If I don't have control over, like, trust me, the political situation in the United States right now, I started to get anxiety. Oh my right? God, I know. So I said, okay, let me just step back here. I don't have, I, all I can do is my part and influence my sphere of people. I don't have any more control over than that. So I can't worry about it. All I can do as much as I can. So, you know, keeping things in perspective and understanding what you can control and can't, you know, to me, it helps me not have anxiety. So I try to stay, you know, every morning I wake up and do my gratitude list, which sets the tone of, of my day. And throughout the day, I pray and meditate. And, you know, meditation to me is quieting your mind. And that's so important. When you get all these thoughts that you can't control, quiet your mind. Meditation. And if anybody out there, you know, is new to meditation, go to my website. I have a, a three-minute, five-minute, and ten-minute guided meditation that can help you quiet your mind. Because when you quiet your mind, then you have no room for the anxiety. I was going to ask you, like, how you already, I'm going to go on your website today. <laughs> Girl, I can just text them to you. I so know. it's on SoundCloud. It's this platform called SoundCloud. And just look up my name, Cynthia Ruiz. And I have those three meditations. And, and I know that meditation is difficult because yeah, it was difficult for me totally to get. It's really challenging for me. So, so having a guided meditation, three minutes. Everybody has three minutes that they can spare. If people say, oh, I'm too busy. Well, you know, you can even, you know, three minutes, you go into your car while you're walking, whatever. And just really, you know, focusing and breathing and quieting your mind. You don't feel anxious. Yeah, I I need help learning how to meditate. At some point, I, I was starting to get better. And then I just, it's the, the thing that people, the excuses of like, I don't have time to do that. And I let, you don't have three minutes a day? Yeah, right? <laughs> I let that kind of just continue on where I was like, I don't have time for that. I'll do that. I'm fine. I'm perfectly fine. And then now I'm in this like panic mode of just like, I need to get better now. Like I need to get fixed now. So like now I'm, I need to slow the freak down. And <laughs> Well, but it's having a spiritual practice. Yes. Right? Because um, same with prayer. I pray every day. I like to say prayer is talking to God and meditation is listening. So I find that so many people will pray and talk to God when they're in panic mode. Yeah. Oh my God, God, if you you just do this for me, I, I'll promise I'll, I'll be good or whatever it is, you know. And instead of saying every day, hey, creator, thank you for giving me another day. I'm grateful. You know, I'm, I'm going to surrender to you and let you guide my way. That's very different than, oh my God, you got to have to do something now. I Don't wait till now. <laughs> yeah, so practice, having a whatever practice that works for you every day versus waiting until you get to that point where it, you're, you know, you're in panic mode. Yeah, and that's, that's kind of what happened. I, I think I read somewhere where it says like your, your brain is like, or maybe it was the opposite, but some, your body is the last to know. So... Or maybe I'm confusing it. But no, it's, no, it's, it is because okay. you, so your everything starts with your brain. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. So if you're panicked, guess what? Your body's getting those the signals, and so if you're in that fight or flight mode, your your muscles tense up. You know, you start having stomach aches. You get muscle cramps, and all that's coming from your mind. You know, you may just be sitting there and all of a sudden get a muscle cramp because your mind's telling you, okay, do something quick. We're, we're in panic mode. Yeah. And so if we quiet your mind, then, you know, it's easier. And like I always say that the word just 
um, disease is dis-ease. You know, you're, you're uncomfortable with something. And of course, I'm sure there's a lot more, you know, medical jargon and science behind it, but it's really about, you know, all those emotions have energy. And so when those emotions are stuck in your body and can't go anywhere, then they can manifest into some kind of disease. Yes. And uh, yeah, I agree. That happens a lot. Um, I think that's why doctors always say like, you need to have ha these healthy habits to prevent. It's like all preventative to create these healthy habits. So eating healthy, exercising, you know, consistently, these are preventative. It's not going to stop anything. It's just to help prevent any further diseases or any extreme diseases. Not that any of that stuff can't happen. Okay, so I just triggered something. So yeah, I did have a, a little bit of anxiety. So earlier this year, I went for my annual physical because I'm good about that. And I was in the pre-diabetic stage. I'm like, oh my God, pre-diabetes. Oh, well, how well can I prevent from getting diabetes full blown. So I gave up all added sugar. So since January, I haven't had any added sugar. Yay. So last week I went to a family reunion and there was a small group, about 30 of us there. Out of the 30 of us, 25 of them had diabetes. Oh, And I'm my like, God. oh my God. It's so, genetic. Yeah, but, it, but also I can, if I have control over what I put in my body, then it's up to me to change. And so, you know, there's I know people from diabetes that have lost limbs and you know had all these other physical problems but you know what if I can cut out sugar and let me tell you I had a sweet tooth I love me some ice cream and <laughs> cookies and all that stuff but if I can invest reframe it and say it's not it's not I'm depriving myself I'm investing in myself and I'm investing in my health so I did go to the back to the doctor recently and um I'm not 100% out of the pre-diabetic stage, but my numbers have really increased, so I'm almost there. Nice, congrats. Thanks, but it's, you know, about choices we make. Seriously, I feel like you have a lot of willpower, though. Well, I don't know if it's <laughs> willpower, but it's like, what do I want? Do I want to go down the path of, because I have one cousin that he's full-on diabetic, and so he, like, shoots himself up with insulin, and I'm like, Oh my God, do I want to, because then I'm, I'm triggered and thinking about my childhood and all those, the heroin addict, my brother, my older brother was a heroin addict and all this other stuff. I'm like, okay, I'm not going down that path. So I, it's not that I'm depriving myself. I'm investing. That's it. It's all about perspective. True. Do you feel like, well, I guess we kind of already mentioned this too, but do you think that like addiction and these bad habits are genetic? So I do believe, you know, that's whole nature versus nurture. I do believe that like diabetes is hereditary, um, but I also believe that we can do our part as much as we can to try to prevent it. So I think it's a combination. You know, I feel like life is not always black and white. There's gray. And so I think, you know, the unfortunately in today's society, when you go to the doctor, they just want to give you a medication. Yeah. Now, I don't want to put my, my housekeeper on blast, but before coming here, I, my, I have this couple that comes and cleans my house. And they've been with me many, many years. And um, the husband was ratting out the wife saying that, you know, and she's the same age as me. She's on a total of 21 medications a day. Oh, wow. And I'm like, what? Because then I, what I'm thinking, that's hurting her liver, her kidneys, all that stuff that has to process it. And I'm like, what doctor, doesn't they, doesn't she have like a primary care physician that says 21 medications is probably not a good idea. Yeah. Like who's allowing that? Right. <laughs> but I think that, you know, and I asked her about it and she goes, well, they gave it to me. And I'm like, you know, going back to choices, we have to also take responsibility for our life. And yes, doctors are important, but at the end of the day, we need to be responsible for our own health and wellness. When I talk about wellness, it's mind, body, and spirit. Yes. And then, okay, so let's tie it back into your book again. Um, so when you're taking care of yourself, would you say that you're able to gravitate healthier relationships? Absolutely. Right? Because if you're happy and healthy, you're going to have a, a lower tolerance 
for those toxic relationships. And, you know, it goes back to keep saying about choice. You have a choice to of whether or not you want to participate in the unhealthy relationships. Now, the only caveat there is family, right? Because we don't necessarily get to choose our family. But what I talk about in the book is that we can we can choose how we participate and how we show up because I don't know about you, but every family I know has some kind of drama. Yeah. And so is it, do we want to participate in that drama? Or sometimes you got to love people from far. And, you know, obviously we have, you know, gatherings and stuff that you have to go to for family obligation, but doesn't mean you have to, when, if like in my family, if everybody starts getting drunk and crazy, it's time for me to leave. I, I don't need <laughs> to participate in that. Loved them. I showed up, but I don't need to participate. Do you drink at all? Actually, I don't. Okay. But the, don't get me wrong. I haven't drank in probably like about 20 years. Okay. But there was a time in my life that I, I drank quite heavily, to be honest, if I'm being, you know, full disclosure here. And it was when I was trying to, I didn't know what to do with all that sexual trauma that I was carrying around. I was trying to bury those feelings and a lot of times people, their emotional baggage, they bury it with alcohol addiction, drug addiction, sex addiction, addiction, gambling, something else, right? A distraction, shopping. Right. Right. And so um, once I was able to heal from the sexual trauma and ironically enough, and we've talked about this before, so it, it wasn't, an, I mean, I forgave myself, I, I forgave the perpetrator, but it wasn't until I forgave myself that I truly healed. And so then I didn't need to drink I mean there wasn't I wasn't trying to cover anything up because I didn't feel that pain anymore did you have like a aha moment like this is why I'm drinking like when did that come out in your mind like well it's it's kind of like oh uh, what am I doing here okay. like it's like this is not healthy and it's like okay well I have responsibilities and I never want it to impact my responsibilities so i need to change nobody else is going to change for me so i just let it go all together and honestly don't miss it i can be in social situations doesn't bother me because just like now with you know um not eating you know added sugar doesn't bother somebody can sit i can sit there and watch you eat a cake i don't really care it's just not for me yeah that's really cool that you can do that <laughs> Because for me, um, and I would say I'm going to blame Jesse on this because he's really bad with sweets. Okay. I never used to be a sweet tooth person. I'm more of a savory person, so I like like chips and stuff. Um, but he really loves sweets. And now that we've been together almost four years, we eat sweets. And now, I'm, I mean, we're, get, we're working on it together, actually, uh, these past two months. Just like try not to have ice cream. Ice cream's hard. <laughs> yeah, right. But you know, <laughs> refined sugar is so bad for you. And you know, I and I know people that are like addicted to soda. Thank God I never really cared for soda. Same, same. You know, but there's, you know, everybody has their things that they get addicted to. I, well, I full disclosure, I'm addicted to coffee. Oh, okay. I have to have my one cup every morning. Now, I don't have it the rest of the day, but I the to get one. me going. I don't know if it's a psychological thing or physical thing, but I love my I love the way it smells. I love the way it tastes, and having that coffee in the morning is just my thing. Is it the same type of coffee, or do you change I it? I grind up? the beans, <laughs> <laughs> smell the beans, and savor it. It's like the but, process of all of it. Yeah, but I don't add sugar. <laughs> okay, wow. Do you add creamer or anything? I add. A sugar-free creamer so oh I do so God. I can't have it I can't have it just black but you know everybody has to figure out what works for them in their life and and to me if that's why I wrote the book if I can show you some tricks and exercises to help you your life better then I've made a difference and you know what would this week I was um, at a meeting and um, some woman that I didn't really recognize came up to me and she was I took one of your classes and, and, and worked with you in one of your workshops and it changed my life. And da, da, da. So that's where I get my rewards from hearing from so many people that I have made a positive difference in their life, no matter how small, no matter how big that feedback is what keeps me going and why I do what I do. Yay. <laughs>
Um, I actually, I might cut this out, but I did want to ask because I, I found myself. Okay. If you said you're going to cut it out, then uh, <laughs> didn't I didn't want to talk about okay, it. Okay. No, I do want to talk okay. about it. So I'm not going to cut it out. <laughs> um, I did want to ask though, cause I found myself doing this as in my late teenage years and early twenties. Um, I find, I found myself uh, seeking the same partner. So like I was going for like the same type of guy. And it was like, it would be a different guy, but he would have like similar traits and they were bad. Like, for example, like um, when I was younger, I gravitated towards like the player type of guys that were like cheating on me and stuff like that. Why do you think, uh, not just women, I guess, why do you think people do that? Like they gravitate towards the same type of person. And Was like, your father a player? <sighs> No, but like he definitely wasn't a good partner. <laughs> well, you know, we we learn about relationships in our youth and our when we're young. Yeah. And so we either are searching for our father or our mother or we're searching for things that that, you know, somehow in our, in our mind we associated relationships with some negative behavior. And so we keep going back until we do the work to to correct in ourself what's missing we keep looking for the same thing it's like mm. banging your head against the wall right <laughs> but you know it's it's the good news out of all this because i'm optimist is things can change people can change you hear that like oh people can't change you right. know people can change if they do the want work to, too. and they want to yeah because even like with alcohol drug unless people want to they're not going to yeah um and yeah, I was, I was finding just like a lot of toxic men, but I mean, I guess you can say that for any like bad relationship you have, like, oh, it was toxic. Um, I don't know. Uh, I found it. But you were participating. Yes. That's the key. Yeah. So stop participating. So it was my fault. <laughs> and, and, well, it's not about fault. It's about awareness and it's about look what it led you to today. I mean, I am a Jesse fan. I know, me too. <laughs> So it's like without sometimes in life, you have to experience what you don't want to finally get what you want. So yeah. you can compare like, oh, I don't want that. But now I have what now you have what you want. So do the work to nurture that. Right. And it, it took me a while. Honestly, like I felt like I had to keep. I, I don't like when people talk badly so like too or they go into too much detail about how much they hate their ex I think that's actually a red flag when you you dwell on it and you t you you there's no accountability and you're kind of just like oh well they were they were assholes they were so toxic they were this and that and then it's like like you're saying like it takes two there's there's two people in that relationship so what were you doing or what were you not doing um, well, when I hear that people say that, and we hear it a lot, that means they haven't, they haven't healed from that experience. Yeah. They haven't grieved the divorce. They haven't, you know, learned their lessons. They haven't healed from that because they're still hanging out or else, you know, have you ever heard me talk about my ex? No. <laughs> because it's the past, right? Only to give me advice or something. <laughs> <laughs> because it's the past. And why would I talk about that when that's not in my present? True. You know, we have to live in the present, you know. The past is gone. The future is not here yet. So I live in the present. So people that do talk about their ex, um, and my pet peeve is don't, don't, you know, husband, ex-husband, ex-wife, don't put your kids in the middle. Yeah. Because I see a lot of that. But it's that person hasn't gotten over that whatever, whatever relationship that was. But they participated and they need to grieve it, heal, and move on. Yeah. And I feel like with me, I did start doing that uh, in my later 20s where I started reflecting about what I was doing and I started reflecting a lot about like, okay, I can take accountability for this failed relationship or like I didn't want this or that or I started looking back and reflecting a lot and I think that's what helped me. Uh, decide what I wanted and what I didn't want in a partner and mm -hmm. that led me to Jesse <laughs> <laughs> and so I feel like you know yeah I was mentioning like our relationship isn't perfect but we definitely both work really hard for our relationship and I think that's why 
we see the benefits and there's so much like love in our relationship and there's a lot of good like it's like healthy it's it's one of my first it's probably my first healthy relationship because you're healthier than you were before yeah i hope so and that's why finding <laughs> same relationship in a crazy world that's all about working on yourself and growing as a person so you could show up as a better person in all relationships in your life yes and i'm so happy that you stopped by today and um we can close out here because we're already at the hour mark uh but where can we find you where can we find your books sure so you can they can always visit my website i love people to visit my website it's my name so it's www.cynthia c-y-n-t-h-i-a i use my middle initial m ruiz.com you can get any of my books on amazon and um, i love to connect with people i'm on instagram facebook linkedin i'm all over place girl <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you again for doing this, Cynthia. I love you for doing this for me and being here. And um, yeah, we close out now. Little sister, I love you. Thank you. I love you too.